Hello, I'm back. Uh, I am back in my little blue room, um, which is quite depressing, actually, because uh, for the first time in quite a long while, I'm actually stuck in four walls. Anyway, welcome, uh, everyone, to today's normal, um, as we are. Um, so no sound issues, hopefully, no camera issues, no weirdness. Um, so welcome to today's Capture One session, that stuff. Um, so if you are not familiar with Capture One, it is a raw processing piece of software uh, made by the guys out in Copenhagen, and it takes your pictures from the raw substance that your camera sees and allows us to process it in a way that hopefully improves it. I say hopefully, because sometimes we go a little bit too far, um, and the risk is that we may not improve things. But this session, for the next hour, we're going to try and edit some of your images uh, live, and we'll try and see what we can do to either fix your problem, um, or see if we can come up things from a different direction. Um, so welcome to everyone that is online. A couple of um, things, I guess, to get started. So first off, today um, in Capture One, we are going to be using the current release of Capture One, which is version 22, as it's marketed. So Capture One 2022, if you think about it in that sense. Um, strangely, version 23 will be around for next year, I would imagine. Um, but if you go to the About screen in Capture One, you will find that it is 15.2 that you're looking for. So that's the current release. That's got some pretty big enhancements to the Apple M1 chips in terms of speed. But there's also you know, bug fixes, camera profiles, all the other stuff that goes into it. And in 15.2, um, you also got the new auto keystone function, um, which is, well, new. Um, makes things a little bit easier with one single click um, and a few other bits in there too. So if you're not running the latest version of Capture One and you want to, then either go to your CaptureOne.com uh, account and download it if you're already subscribing. So if you subscribe, that's what you pay for to be always on the latest version. If you don't um, and you want to buy an upgrade, that's on CaptureOne.com. If you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about and have never used this before and don't know what that screen is, then go to CaptureOne.com, download it, free trial, works for 30 days, um, and knock yourself out. Uh, not literally, that would be bad, but anyway. So welcome to everyone that is online, uh, live. For those of you that are, please make sure you don't hold back with questions and stuff like that. Um, so if you've got a question as we're editing, then put it into the chat. We'll try and cover as many as we can along the way. As long as um, it's something which is <laughs> relevant to what we're doing, we'll try and bring it up and cover as much as we can. So on top of that, all that stuff, um, also remember we made a change, or we announced a change last week to these sessions, so they're not going to be weekly anymore, they're now going to be monthly. So these um, online sessions will continue, it's just going to be the first Thursday of every month. Today's the first Thursday of May, cool. Um, but also once a month there are going to be masterclasses, so these things. Um, this is the first one that we're going to do on the 24th of May, um, which will be at 3 o'clock UK time, so whatever that is for where you are. Um, these are not the same as our editing sessions. So these are in-depth, specific, subject-focused masterclasses. So it's not going to do things like cover your images. It's not going to cover um, random questions about different technology and different developments and bug fixes and stuff like that. We're going to take one topic. So in this case, we're going to start with night cityscapes and go from everything from the very beginning, so the actual capture um, camera settings, stuff like that, all the way through to getting the file print ready um, and ready to go out. Because that's what makes it kind of a picture, isn't it, when we see it on a wall, hopefully. Um, so, first one of those is on the 24th of May. You will find the link to that in the description of this video. Um, it's going to be limited. We will cap it at a certain number of people. We're just trying to work out exactly what that number is. Um, but we want to make it as relatively small and interactive as we can. Um, so there you go. If you want to learn end-to-end um, -end how we actually produce a night cityscape uh, from beginning to end and everything in between, then that's the way to do it, that one. Um, so join in if you want to. Now, uh, that said, so let's go. That's all the, I think that's all the admin stuff. That's good. Not admin stuff, but kind of uh, off track for, for main Capture One, but will be coming increasingly more on track for Capture One, I guess is this little fun and games. Um, so capture one for iPad. Now, for quite some time, uh, I've been able to use iPad for my um, shooting. So we can tether it to a phase one digital back um, using something called Cascable. And that's great when we're out in the field, but that gives me control of the capture. It doesn't necessarily give me control of editing. So for those of you that know, some of you will be in the beta program already. For those of you that aren't or don't, this is coming. Um, so it's in beta now. Um, it will be delivered soon, 
in terms of version one or the first release. When soon is, I don't actually know. Um, the developers may do, but I think that's still being worked on. But what it means is one iPad. So this thing starts to become a lot more useful because we can use it as a companion app on the road to do editing. So we're going to run through exactly what's in there at the moment. It will change, I'm sure, over time, but this is what we're at um, in terms of the current beta version um, as of... It was either yesterday or today there was an update. Either way. So let's have a look. Now, I have one of these, a, um, a weird, whizzy pencil thing. Um, in version 1... It does not deliver, the first release of Capture One for iPad, does not deliver things like masking and layers and stuff like that. So, limited in terms of what we can do on this, but it's designed to be a companion for the desktop. So, this is more around base edits, culling, rating, and stuff like that to work alongside full-on Capture One for desktop. It also means that we can do a lot of the pre-work out in the field before you come back, but this is all part of Capture One's plan to build a sort of cloud ecosystem that, that has everything linked um, in amongst everything. Um, Paula, 12-inch iPad, I presume. This one, my one, yes. Um, so this is an M1 Pro. Um, this is the big one uh, with lots of storage, which kind of helps, and you'll, you'll see why. Um, but also the bigger storage iPads have a slightly faster processor. Oh, sorry, not faster processor. They've got more RAM. That's what it is. Um, so it allows you to... Um, potentially have bigger images up. So when I'm dealing with big, big images, um, hopefully that's giving us a bit of a boost. I have seen people um, talk about some challenges they've got in particularly older uh, older iPads. Ugh, getting stuck. Let's, let's go with uh, jet lag for the reason I can't talk right now. So older iPads or smaller iPads and stuff like that. So of course, there is a list of supported iPads that will work, but why work? It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the best experience. So some things need a bit of screen real estate. Some things need a bit of power. So if you're thinking about getting an iPad for Capture One, think about the real usability of it. Maybe get the bigger one, maybe get the faster one. Um, you know, life's about choices always, but that's what I would do. So through the power of modern technology, we're going to switch across to my iPad. That's kind of cool, isn't it? You can even see where my finger is. Not really. It's a mouse. But we can use a mouse on it through universal control, which is also kind of funky. So um, here is my shack um, from the middle of uh, California. Anyway, this is your interface to Capture One for iPad. You will see it's very different to the standard interface in Capture One. Now, Capture One itself obviously is a very powerful tool, and it's been slimmed down and, and streamlined to do the most important things live um, when you're out in the field. So interface-wise, you know, standard stuff. We've got a, a menu bar along here. We've got our copy and apply stuff. We've got a little film strip along the bottom, so things aren't quite the same. You know, browsers on the side, typically in the desktops, on the bottom for iPad. Some of that's because the iPad's a 4 by 3 screen, so it sort of makes sense to use the bottom rung. Um, but you've also got, obviously on here, um, where are we? Here, um, all of our little tools. And you'll see it's a subset of the tools. It's not the full set, but that's obviously gonna be built on as new releases come out. So, you know, our masks and layers on the roadmap, yes, the developers are looking at it, they're talking about it. Are things, you know, like, um, like lens profiles and stuff like that, you know, will that be on the roadmap? Well, if you look at the roadmap for what's possible, yeah, all of that stuff is possible. It's just gotta be prioritized. So, we have a standard interface here. I've got my tools on the left. Capture One for iPad is very heavily geared towards styles as well as ratings and stuff. So, if you imagine this is like a culling process, so we can rate stuff, uh, we can color tag it. So, I've now got stuff that will sync into the cloud so I can review it later on. Really helpful. Um, I can go to my styles. So, in my styles here, we've got custom styles loaded in. So, these copy across from the desktop. And I can apply not just one style, but multiple styles. I can't apply it to a layer. So remember, the initial release of Capture One for iPad does not have layers and masks and, and the tools around that. But what it does have is the presets. It also has styles that you can load in your own, um, as well as other people's. And you can customize and you can save styles live in it. Uh, let's just cover a couple of questions. So... Um, Philip, hello from Oxted, and David's in there. There you go. You two can go for a beer tonight. Ah, oh, isn't that sweet? 
Um, so what about auto adjustment? There are some adjustments in there that, that will do that, but also remember you've got your presets, you've got all of your, your style stuff too, so it's got a lot of that stuff in there. But we'll run through some of the um, some of the functions in a second. Um, if Catcher 1 works the way I'd like to see it, I'll go for the new iPad Pro 12. Um, I would, Paula, to be honest, um, this this thing is insane. Um, is it, I've got it set up here on the, the sort of floating thing, um, floating keyboard, the smart keyboard. Um, I can use it as a laptop. Um, now, obviously, depending on the software that's loaded onto it and what it, what it provides me with. But yes, um, I would... Um, if you're doing real photo editing, I'd go for that. Because the only thing as well that I would say is with Capture One on an iPad, it's only going to get more feature rich over time. So the more and more features that go onto it, the more screen you're probably going to want to do. Uh, Eric, today is just iPad stuff. No, no, it's not. Um, I just said we're going we're gonna to cover it to begin with. So we'll go into the desktop in a second. Don't worry. Um, Paul, is it possible to transfer catalogs and sessions completely from iPad to another computer? Yes, but in a roundabout way, um, not not as you think. Um, so you'd have to import effectively from a location. We'll cover that in a second. Um, but yeah, it's not um, it's not quite the same way that that works. But the whole idea, and if you think about this as a mindset, the guys in Capture One want this to behave um, as a complete ecosystem within the cloud. So you should be looking at. In fact, let's just go back to here. We go. So here's my file um, control. So, in fact, we've got Ali's shot in here, which we're going to go run through on the desktop. Don't worry, Eric. We're going to run through this on the desktop in a bit. Um, but you'll see, you know, I can load in files. We can import files from different destinations. Also from, you know, if you're running these things uh, when you're out on remote, um, you can load in um, your files directly off of drives or off of memory card readers and so on. You can import from photos too. Um, and you've got obviously a sorting here into different albums and all that sort of stuff. So yes, um, it is possible to work in that way, but it's not at the moment going to work in quite the same setup until that cloud link is complete. Um, so the beta stuff, you know, you know, that's the whole point. It's still being tested, but when it is um, done, that's the whole point that you will be able to go backwards and forwards. Um, Jeff, where is the shack? Is it in? Uh, it's in the Salton Sea. It's in uh, Bombay Beach, Jeff. Um, if capture, oh, sorry, chilly. Sorry, if capture one is charging extra for the iPad in addition to the desktop purchase, I'll wait a few versions for it to mature. Yeah, um, and that's that's absolutely the choice. So you've got the option um, of you know, no one's making anyone buy anything. Um, certainly not me. Um, so if you don't see benefits in the initial features that are in the iPad app. Wait, wait until version 1.1, 1.2, 2, whatever. Um, so, uh, oh, one, sorry, one question. Does this mean that Capture One is going to move to require a cloud connection, even for the desktop version? No. Um, and in fact, there you go, there's, there's proof. David has just proved no. Um, what it means is that Capture One absolutely will integrate through the cloud. So if you want to use iPad and desktop, the two will come together in a way that that experience is seamless. That's the point of it. Um, right, so let's just have a little look back on our app here. So we've got our you know, standard picture. Let's go into this picture. So we've run through, you've got ratings um, and all that stuff. We've got our styles and presets. So you've got all the standard styles that are built in, but also any custom ones that you've bought or built. We've got cropping um, and we've got things like our standard aspect ratios and all that sort of stuff. We've also got in here all our normal tools. So our basic standard tools, white balance, exposure, HDR clarity sliders, all that sort of stuff. So if we go to clarity, we can click on here. So there's our clarity option. And then we've got a second wheel on the right hand side. So some people are using two fingers. Some people are using one finger and one of these. Um, some people are using just one finger because what I can do is just hold down on clarity and then swipe up and swipe down. And you'll see that wheel on the right is changing values. So it goes up like that or down like that. Um, and just like in the main desktop thing, if I double click on any of the adjusters, it will reset back to zero. So you have got dehaze built in there, which is interesting. Um, so click and hold, and then we can go up or down, all cool. And then with all that stuff um, set, what we can do, let's just go into here. 
we can actually create presets for some of these tools. So you've got some functions in here which are actually really powerful that we can apply then to lots and lots of different shoots, lots of different albums, lots of different images, all the way across um, your different, different collections and different shoots. And you've got the ability to copy and paste. So if I go into my, let's pick on an Iceland shoot. So if we went into here, and let's imagine we said, well, actually, our uh, let's bring our highlights down, our shadows up a little bit, not too much. That'll do. We can copy those adjustments, and then we can say select that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one, and then we can apply them. So it applies to all of them. So it's a really quick way when you're out in the field of editing very simple edits, but more importantly, being able to control things like ratings, color tags, so that when you get back to base, you can pull all these things up on the desktop and you'll be able to actually use all of that time that was saved to just focus on the images that are important. Um, where are we? A couple questions. Um, Anthony, how do you calibrate your iPad screen to match your computer monitor? You can't, um, is, is the answer. Um, so the iPad screen has a different setup um, to the monitor. So if you're running on something like an ISO screen or whatever back at base, your iPad's not going to match that. But part of this is about thinking about the reason for it. This is a companion app for your main editing. So am I expecting people to do completely color accurate work on this um, when they're out in the field? Possibly not. I mean, for a start... A lot of people are going to be using these in places that aren't ideal, not not light controlled, you know, with reflections and all that stuff as well. So just be aware. Um, Power, will it work OK on other iPad versions? So my understanding is it works OK. Um, some iPads, you know, faster iPads will work better. Slower iPads will work slower. Um, but, you know, the new Air, I think, from memory is a pretty powerful, pretty capable iPad. Um, so I can't see any problem with that, for example. Um, so, uh, where are we? Uh, da, da, da. Um, Chile, I was glad to hear it's not going that way. In terms of requiring cloud, no. But, um, as David says and points out, um, a lot of people now need cloud. I mean, I do. The whole time I was away um, last month um, out in the US, every single file that I've got is already sat here waiting for me at base because um, it's all done through cloud storage, NAS stuff, um, and synchronization. So, I kind of want to see um, that integration. There's no point in me having a divorced set of applications, one for on the road and one for when I'm back at base. Uh, that just doesn't make sense. Um, Roger, how would you get images off an SD card and onto the iPad? With the little media dock. Um, so you can buy, uh, it's a little USB-C or a, a lightning connector. Um, it, appear, it appears in your files then as an import um, and all cool. I would show you, but then I lose the ability to show you the screen, which is which would ruin things a little bit. Um, but yes, you plug it in the bottom um, and then you can explore that card um, in the same way that you could a file. And actually, we quite often use the SanDisk drives, the little, um, the little SSD drives um, for the same sort of purpose. Um, Victor, is there any coupon code for the May 24th Masterclass? Yes. Um, if you type in I love Paul, it will increase the price by 100%. You're welcome. Um, so, uh, JD, the iPad version would be best used for use on airplanes while returning from a shoot. Yeah, airplanes in the car or even, you know, while you're waiting or, you know, you've, if you've got a weather hold or something like that, you know, you can't shoot. Um, then this is a good way of just culling stuff, you know, going through, doing a quick check, you know, are my shadows okay? If I, if I do pull up my shadows, have I got too much noise in there? Can noise correction fix it? Because we can do some of those things in here. Um, so all of that stuff just, you know, yes, it's designed to do exactly that. It's designed to be a helper application to make things more efficient. Think workflow. That's the key thing. And um, when you're done, so you can export straight from the app into JPEG, or you can actually export the EIP. So you can give it to a retoucher or whatever um, with all your edits in there. But let's go JPEG. We can choose web optimized, Instagram optimized, whatever. You can include a basic watermark at the moment. So it's got the text watermark in there. Um, whether that's going to change in the future, I'm not sure. But it's got the functionality in there to put this stuff in. So you could sit from a shoot while you're out there without needing to go to your computer, run through all the edits, rate them, send the top you know, five star ones to client with watermarks, whatever you want to do. Um, and you're all done. So ready for when I get back to base on the proper big desktop app, 
is all sat there waiting with my edits um, and I can play. So talking about the desktop app, um, before Victor, or sorry, Eric gets too concerned, um, let's switch into the desktop app. So that being this one, that uh, Capture 122, and we're going to load up Ali's shot, unless there are any other questions. So uh, where are we? Da, da, da. No, I think we're good. Uh, JD, as I keep as I keep mentioning, you're sounding frustrated, JD. Uh, to me, the iPad is primarily for culling and the occasional field tethering. Keep the serious stuff for the real computer. Yes. So one other thing to bear in mind: the initial launch of iPad Capture One does not allow for that, which is tethered capture. Um, at the moment, there are other apps that do that. It will come. It's on the roadmap. It is being developed, um, but for version one, it is not going to include tethering. When it does, I'm pretty sure people are going to find it very, very, very handy. Right. So there we go. That was that was iPad done. Whirlwind iPad thing. But if you're in the beta group, please, please, please keep using it. Keep testing it. Keep breaking it um, because the developers need to know uh, what, uh, what the issues are before it goes live. It is due live relatively soon. Um, and when it does, I'm pretty sure people are going to it's going to be a Marmite one, isn't it? People are going to either love it or they're going to you know, get to a point where it's like, I'm not sure what this does for me. If you're in a place where you can't picture it in your workflow, there's nothing wrong with just holding off and starting to see how other people are using it because it might actually spark an idea in your head and go, oh, that could be useful for me too. Um, so have a look at it. See how it fits into your workflow when it's ready and when it's out. But it is a separate app. Yes, it does come at a separate cost. Yes. Um, but part of this is about a bigger strategy of getting the whole workflow from end to end, just like we talk in masterclass stuff. Um, end to end is literally a case of from shoot to final print, everything being controlled within Capture One in a way that you don't ever have to break your workflow along the way. Okay, so um, Ali shot. We touched on this last week um, when I was <laughs> randomly looking like a passport photo in this little box here. Um, so now we're back on a big screen, a proper screen. We can actually run through this properly. Um, so this is a shot, um, as Ali's put it, as Branco's lookout. Um, now, it's taken as a panoramic. This is the actual pano output that Ali sent in. And they've also sent in two TIFF files. So this one, I'm presuming, slightly more finished. Um, this one here, another option um, again. Now, in terms of this shot here, it you know I'm okay with the blend. I'm okay with the stitch. This one here, I'm seeing something that I don't particularly like on it, and I'm then going back to the original pano stitch to see why. And it's this. So there's unevenness in light in this shot. So you can see. It go, you know, of course, when it, when it comes to sunrise and sunset, there's unevenness in light across the entire scene. There always will be. But what I'm seeing is joins. Um, and when I see joins, that's always a giveaway that the pano stitch has been made from images that have a heavy vignette of some sort. Now, vignette, we sometimes add at the end of a process. But actually, most images, most lenses have something called light fall off, um, which is basically vignetting. So when I go back to my raws, what I'm looking at is, is there vignetting? Is there light fall off around these raws? Because what then happens when I go to stitch them all together, if you imagine each single image has got a bright bit in the middle and then dark bits on the outside, well, those dark bits join together and you end up with a sort of mottled effect. You end up with you know, bright area, dark line, bright area, dark line, as they all stitch together. And that's what we're seeing up here in the sky and to an extent down here. So if we look at this shot here, even without playing with it, I can see there is light fall off because look, we can see it's much brighter here than it is there. And it's not down to the sun or the position of the sun because it's the same in all these pictures. So this one's looking away from it and we're getting, you know, dark corners up here, light areas in the middle. This is natural. There's nothing wrong with the, the camera. There's nothing wrong with the lens. All lenses have to an extent certain amounts of light fall off. Some are better than others. So the key thing here to do before you do this stitch, way before we even start editing, is to fix that light fall off. Absolutely, the light fall off has to be done before we start blending things together. So let's go into this one here. 
and let's look at what lens we were actually using. I can't see it in here, unfortunately, because it didn't send the data through. But Capture One has decided that it's probably one of these two. Now, this is risky. Generally, I wouldn't tell you to do this to try and, you know, I guess, guess um, which one it was. But I've had a little, I'll have a little sneaky play with this earlier. And the lens profile itself is actually doing good things. So if I set my light fall off to 100, we could also fix some distortion. But with a lens that I'm not entirely sure of, I don't know the exact lens that was used on it, I would be very careful playing it. Ah, sorry. Ah, whoever it was. So um, Ali submitted There we go. This helps. Um, Ali submitted it. So um, for vascular doc, I'm guessing that's a medical person. Um, so the lens for the original photos was a Samyang 18mm 2.8, so not the greatest lens. Um, it's manual, so it doesn't send information to the camera, which makes sense. And it also means that it is not likely to fit into the standard stuff in here. So in which case, you know, I know that it does work on the other um, profile, but we can use the generic one and use a little bit of light fall off. Having played with it, I'm just going to play with lesser of two evils, as it were. I'm going to stick with, in fact, let's just go with this version. And I'm going to stick with the Zeiss lens profile. Don't, nor, don't oh, I've told everyone for, for now years, don't just pick a random lens thing. But if you can get it to work, <laughs> um, then oh, it, it can work. Just be really careful. Try not to use distortion. Try not to use any diffraction stuff, because all those metrics are going to be wrong. For the actual lens that was used but if you can get a good result out of it especially with light fall off then maybe use that uh jeff for your question um how can you have more than 100 percent light fall off because what it can do is it can take those edges and it can say right what's the worst case scenario that's zero percent so as it was all the way to 100 percent, which is as if the lens had no fall off whatsoever then if you go above 100%, it's as if the lens actually gets brighter at the edges. So some people choose to do that. Um, yeah, For the reasons why, I'm not exactly sure, but that's why it allows you to go a bit further. You can actually get the lenses brighter than neutral, um, and that's why it goes up to 120, I think. Let's just have a look. Yeah, 120. Okay, so with that profile loaded in and that um, fall-off um, determined, um <laughs> i wish i had a size uh good point so let's just choose all of these well you can virtually we're gonna add we're gonna give you a zeiss lens put or virtually from here so i'm just applying that lens profile to everything that was in that selection for those of you that are wondering how it did that to all of them i see this quite a lot a lot of people don't have edit selected ticked up here on the toolbar in fact a lot of people don't even have that icon up there so if you don't go to customize toolbar You'll find it here. You can drag it up and put it there. If I do not have that enabled, when I go to apply, so I can copy adjustments and I can apply them. So up here, we've got a little arrows. It'll only apply them to the one that is highlighted. So although everything is selected, the thin border, only the one with the thick border will actually get that applied. If I click on that one, everything that's selected will get applied. Hence, edit selected. Cool. So these now all have that lens correction done. Stitch the panorama. We can go back to spherical. Now, I'm not wanting to pick on vascular doc, but I'm going to, because I believe, by nature of how this tries to stitch it, that your tripod wasn't exactly level. Um, now, with an ultra-wide lens, you can end up with a slight skewing on it, but this is why it is important, especially if you're using a ball head. Um, when David and I did the rooftop session in London, oh, oh, I don't even remember when that was. I think it was before Christmas. I don't remember. Anyway, December time, maybe. Um, we showed you ball heads, and there's a difference. Some ball heads only have a, a spirit level on the very top, which doesn't help you to work out whether the base is level. You need to make sure that the base of your tripod, and therefore what the head is revolving around, is also level so that you don't get this issue. It doesn't really matter because we can fix the rotation later, but you're losing a lot as a result of that crop. Um, <laughs> David doesn't know either. So November, December, yeah. Um, 
one way or another. It was it was the end of last year. Go on to capture one dot oh, sorry, capture one com. Go on to capture one's YouTube channel. Have a look at live from London um, with David and I. Um, and there, <laughs> there we go. Called it. Uh, it was a ball head, no spirit level. So these are things that will help you if you're going to take pano stuff um, really seriously over time. Get one of those, and also consider getting one of those, um, one of the rails that allows us, or a nodal rail that allows us to spin around um, different positions. Right, um, there we go. David's to the rescue, 14th of December. So if you're looking, have a look there. It's on the Live from London um, session. Right, that's our pano stitched, and it's going to appear at the bottom behind my head. Um, well, I'm not going to get out of the way. I'm just going to move it up there so you can see it. So there's our DNG. Now remember, the DNG that comes out of Capture One's pano stitching is a fully editable raw. There's no issue with that. I'm just going to move it up here together. So this one, I think, has had some edits to it. Let's just reset it. There we go. So that was the DNG originally. And this is our new one. You see it's a lot brighter. And the most important thing is on this one, when I start to pull down, if I pull down highlights, and let's do, I'm going to go to an extreme just to show you, and pull up clarity... Even if we pull up dehaze, I can start seeing these lines appear in the sky. If I copy those settings and paste them to this one, huh, not quite. We've still got some of the lines, but it's just not as heavy. Um, and actually what that means is we should maybe take another lens profile even with that just to try and push it further. Ideally, if you've got the right lens profile loaded in, it will get the light fall off a lot better. Um, but yeah, ideally... Get a, lens, get a lens that's got the got a profile that um, you can use, but make sure you're using the right light fall off amount before you try and stitch this stuff because with that vignetting, it can be a real challenge. Okay, editing it itself. So number one, let's fix this horizon. So straighten tool up here. I could try, in fact, I'm going to try, but I don't think it's going to work. So auto rotate. Ah, huh? I'm impressed. There we go. It's official. I'm impressed. I thought that was going to struggle, but it's got a strong horizon. It doesn't care about the crop out here. So auto-rotate. We've done it pretty good, actually, I think. Let's just double-check. Even with a rotation that you're happy with, double-check with a guide. Always put a guide up and just make sure that it looks level. It is. It's just that, that hill over there or that mountain is a bit, um, bit higher. So that's good. And then we're going to recrop. We want to get rid of this person and some of this stuff out here. So let's just crop in to our usable area in here. So maybe we go into there and probably into there. So we're losing quite a lot of this space that's been stretched, but you can see how distorted this stuff is. You know, you don't have to include everything into a pano. The whole point was to get the good stuff in the middle. And we, again, we talk about this in, um, in that London one, but think about you really, really want to make sure that you're overshooting a pano. Because look at how much you've got to be prepared to give away with the pulling and stretching that the stitching is going to do. So, yes, absolutely. Do do from the, the limit of left and right, but go further. And do from the limit of up and down, but go further. Always get wider and bigger than you actually need because you need to be prepared for this sort of crop. Now, one of the things that Ali mentioned um, was that there was a struggle with trying to get these rocks to look as red as they really were. So a few different ways. Number one, just because I can, I'm going to play and add on maybe a golden hour. Um, don't want to go morning coffee because that's going to um, mist it up a little bit. So golden hour with highlight correction. I'm going to apply it to a new layer. Now that's too heavy for my liking. So with that, with this layer, I'm just going to back away that style all the way down to 50. So we're reducing it. So I've applied one of the elevation styles and then removed half of it. So we can always back away. Um, we can't add more. So that's why they're designed to be a bit heavy on the basis that we can pull them back. Now, what about the sky up here? So I'm going to add a new layer. We're going to label it correctly call it sky, and we're going to add a nice little gradient. Now, I haven't got my mask turned on, but if I did, that's what I'd see. Press M on your keyboard. You can turn your mask on and off. Really easy. Now, one thing I've shown a few people recently um, with the gradients, yes, I can expand that gradient, but now I start to get more of this involved. I want some fall off, but remember these lines mean 100% applied, 50% applied, 0% applied. 
but I can hold down the option key on the keyboard to make this asymmetrical. So I don't have to be stuck with this 150 zero at equal measures apart. I can hold down the option key on either the 100% line or the 0% line and control it independently. So I can go down to here and say, okay, that's pretty hard, or pretty soft fall off here, and then it drops off very quickly. Beyond that, if I really want to be picky, I can go to my Luma range, and I can say exclude this tree stuff. So maybe we get to there, make sure we're not excluding stuff that we want included. So maybe we got to there and get rid of some of the mountains too. That's looking pretty good. Bit of a soft fall off, so we don't notice where it's dropped off quite so much. Bit of a soft radius as well, especially when we're dealing with things like leaves. So that means that where it falls off or where it drops off, especially with something that's dark in front of a light area, that doesn't get the benefit of this fall off between what is included and what isn't. So instead, we can use a radius on the edge, in other words, where it joins the, the parts that's not included in the Luma range. And that radius allows us to smooth that edge so it doesn't look quite so digital and, and binary at the end. Um, where are we? So I just want, I've just seen a question come in, which is actually a very good question. And we are going to cover it. So recently found that Capture One has a lens cast correction tool. Yes, it does. Would that help in the case where you don't have a lens profile and need to correct the fall off? Yes, it would. So without going into huge amounts of detail, under your LCC thing here, you can create a lens cast calibration profile. Now, what we mean by that is Every lens has its own features and benefits and, you know, also things like dust that are in the lens. I don't mean dust on the lens. Clean that. Get your, get your lens clean. But sometimes you can get things like shutter dust from leaf shutters and stuff inside the lens elements. You can also get scratches, you, can get, you know, stuff that's permanently there. So there are color cast to lenses. There are light fall off elements to lenses. And there are things that are inside the lens that go wrong. You can create an image in Capture One called an LCC, which is basically we put a white piece of um, perspex. In fact, you can't see, sorry, I was talking about these elements here and you can't see it. So this is the LCC panel. We take a picture with a white piece of perspex or even that you can do it with a piece of paper as long as you can get light through it. So we take that picture, we process it in Capture One and basically use that, because we tell Capture One, everything in this picture should be plain, level, neutral, and light. So the stuff that's not, Capture One can then use that profile to apply to other images, which is kind of like your lens correction. It's not quite, because it doesn't do distortion, doesn't do sharpness fall off, but it does for light. So what it means is you can apply that LCC to every picture that's then been taken with that lens in that session. It's a really useful tool. Um, to Joe's point, is there a prototype on LCC? No, there isn't. Um, it's more practical than that. I don't know how we show that really. Let me have a think about that. Um, we may do it as part of a camera setup thing or something. Yeah, let me have a let me have a think about it. But. Yes, LCC is very handy. Um, a lot of people are scared of them. They're nothing to be scared of. And it would help you with things like light fall off. Um, Paul, LCC profiles are well known for stuff like a lens or like a cameras with non-like a lenses. Yeah, so if ever you're in a manual world, in this case, we kind of are as well. Um, the LCC allows you to fix some of this stuff, not all of it, but some of this stuff in the final picture. Um you know, the, the XT, so Phase 1's XT and the new X-Series um, lenses with the Rodenstock glass have got all this built in. Um, but, you know, technical camera guys have been using LCC since the year dot um, with this stuff. So it's a really powerful tool. We'll th let me think about how we, um, how we do this. Um, but it's, yeah, it is very, very useful. Um, Andreas, do I need an LCC file for each shot in a panorama or is one shot sufficient for the whole panorama? One shot is sufficient because um, as long as it's um, taken in the equivalent, so the same settings as your panorama, as long as you're not changing something like aperture from one side to the other or whatever else, um, then yeah, you do one for the main um, center um, image and it will apply to all of the ones that were taken in that same session. Um, so yeah, let's um, let's have a think about it. Um, Tim, so it's like using light frames in astrophotography. 
kind of it, it does something slightly different um but it's it's the same principle about using a calibration frame to apply it to every other frame afterwards um tim i have lens data for some of my lenses not available in capture one any chance to get them in if you send in a feature request and it's a lens that is worth doing and I, I, this sounds horrible but if you've got a lens that you're one of 20 people in the world that still own it, no, it's not worth Capture One building it into the profiles. And actually, I don't want to see a lens profile list in my Capture One of a million different lenses and everything that was put out there. So there comes a limit where it's got to be viable, it's got to be useful to a larger number of people. But if it is, they may have just missed it. It may just be relatively new. It may be old. Um, but... It's worth sending in a feature request. They'll they'll come back to you at some point and say, you know, yes, it's being considered or no, it's not. Um, but you won't be able to put it in yourself. It has to be done by Capture One. Um, oh, we're going into an if we're going into an LCC rabbit hole. Okay, so would LCC be beneficial for images using ND filters where there is color cast? Yes, it would um, because it's able to then apply um, what's what's happening from that filter. So it could be cast, it could be vignetting, it could be, you know, it could be a scratch on the filter, whatever, but it allows you to then use that data to then fix the rest of the images from it. So yes, um, LCCs are very handy. I just need to think of a way. So to to um, <laughs> to, to JD's point, um, yeah, we need to have a look at how we demonstrate it because it's actually more practical that I can't just show you in Capture One. We've got to show you some of the camera stuff too, but we'll we'll see if we can find a way. Marcus, but back on track. Should we uh, remove vignette, etc., before stitching, or go with the rules for stitching? Um, for your lens corrections, I would absolutely set these um, before stitching. Um, so get your lens profile corrections, get the light fall off done, get defringing done, chromatic aberration done before stitching, a hundred percent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> let's um let, let's get back to um let's get back to here so we have our new sky layer on here that sky layer has got uh, let's just go into our grayscale mouse so you can see what that's done so we've now got a very very neat layer we could have done it with a magic brush but i kind of like this way because it allows a fall off at the horizon so with that layer on there we can reduce our highlights down a touch it's looking pretty good we can put some contrast in now. We can actually cool down the sky a touch, get some of those blues back. And if we want to, we could pull up a touch of saturation. Remember, this saturation here isn't as brutal as the color editor's um, pure saturation option. Um, but just don't, again, don't push it too far. Little bit of structure just to get some of these cloud wisps up. Little bit of clarity. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Now, what about the rest of the image? Well, we covered this sort of last week, actually, um, I think, from memory. So we've got a layer here, which is sky. Well, I can create a new empty layer, call this not sky, or I can call it foreground or whatever. Um, right click, copy mask from sky. Right click, invert mask. Now, what's happened? Why did that go wrong? think about it or has it gone wrong so i've seen this question in a couple of um, different sessions on, on forums online so what's happened here because i just inverted the mask so why is it still selecting the sky the reason is that the luma range has not inverted so even though the mask is inverted i'm still selecting only this stuff the bright stuff now i can invert that range and apply that i can right click and go to invert mask although that is something weird <laughs> why is it doing that there's a better way of doing it anyway but i'm not sure why exactly it's doing what it's doing there because that shouldn't that's a bit weird okay so the way that we're going to do it we're going to go back to our normal mask there we go right click and rasterize it first so i'm not sure why we're getting the weird thing there it should have inverted the mask but we should still only select the stuff that was in the original um, luma range but be careful with luma ranges when you're inverting masks because the mask is not the same as the luma range if i invert this this mask but my luma range remains the same all that's happening is i'm i'm inverting where is drawn but i'm not inverting what is selected in this range for that, I'd need to invert the Luma range as well. There is an easier way of doing this, though. 
So once you've copied the mask across from Sky, right click, rasterize the mask. You notice the Luma range icon disappears. It's because it's no longer editable in the way that it was before. It's no longer, this one here is still a graduated filter. This one here is not. This one here, I've still got the option of the Luma range. I can edit it. This one here, I don't. It's going to start from, from scratch. So now it's rasterized. In other words, it's the exact opposite and it's baked in with all those settings. I can now invert it. And now I have a not sky mask. Now, if I want to further refine it and definitely get rid of the rest of the, the sky, I can go to my Luma range and kind of use the opposite. So we can go down from the light areas until we get rid of the sky. That's looking pretty good. We've got a bit of a hole in it there. That's okay, because what I'm going to do is go to apply, rasterize it again. You can keep rasterizing. doesn't matter. Go to my brush. And with 100% opacity, nice small brush, we're just going to fill in the hole. Done. So you can use your Luma range up top to exclude stuff and then go into the, the finer stuff and just add in um, all those things. Um, Jim, no, so the, you still have a gradient selected. Yeah, I did, but the, the gradient should have inverted. So I'm a bit, a bit confused by that, but it doesn't matter because the better way of doing it genuinely is to rasterize it first and then just invert the whole thing. So if you've got a Luma range on top of any form of, of mask itself, easier way is to copy the mask, rasterize it, and then invert it um, over. Um, Joe, apply a style first or as kind of a final touch? Your choice, it depends. If you, if the style is key to the look of the image, then there's no harm in doing it early on. If the style is something you're playing with because you want to have a think about how things look, um, then maybe do it last um, and just add it as a new layer um, with a different amount. But yeah, um, that's, that's going to be down to your workflow, your preference. Okay, so um, with our mask now, not sky mask. So a few ways of making this red. One is, well, we could just warm up the white balance and the tint, and we can get it to sort of a more pinky level. I don't like that. Instead, I think the better option is we go into our color editor, go to advanced, and we choose some of this rock. So maybe we choose this bit here. And with it, we can increase our saturation. Again, not too much. That's not even a mask. That's just literally red. Um, so if your eyes are bleeding, be really, really careful. Um, don't push it too far. So a little bit of saturation. Let's go to about there. We can lighten it up. We can darken it down. Now, as you go deeper and darker, it's going to appear that that saturation is heavier. It's not actually. It's just to our eyes, it becomes more saturated. Um, but, you know, we can go to probably there, something like that. We could, you know, we could go, um, let's go into our basic here. We can actually shift the oranges and we can say the oranges need to be more red or pink if you go too far or more yellow and green if you go too far. So there's our oranges move to yellow. There's our oranges move to red. So let's take our oranges. So not the bit that I clicked, but in general, anything that's orange colored, and we're going to make that hue a little redder, a little more saturated, maybe a little lighter, just to offset it. And we get to a place where, with just a quick change with the red itself, so we've boosted the red a bit, we've taken the oranges and said they need to be more red than orange. I'm going to leave the yellows alone because it'll look a bit odd, but we go from there, which looks a bit washed out, to there, which just feels deeper, richer, and all that stuff. Back to our exposure tab, we can put up our clarity. So with rocks and texture and stuff like that, it's a really good idea to try and pull out some of those details. And then I guess the real killer one in this one is use dehaze a little bit. So not too much. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, but you can just pull up dehaze a touch. And what it's going to do in this case here, there isn't really haze here but it's going to take away this sort of bland beigey color from all of the content in that mask. So if you imagine it's removing that, what it's left with is the color underneath. So if you really, really, really want to, you know, make things a bit richer, that's without the dehaze. That's with it. It's, it's just making it pop a little bit more. That's all. Um, and that's sort of where I'd get to. So that's our original stitch. That's where I'd go with it. We're not a million miles away 
from where you were there um and and actually on your original dng with your edits you know we're not we're not well in fact we are we we we, we have definitely made it redder um but from here if the the intention and the request was we want it to look more red rocky and more golden then that's how to do it if that's too much and if you're sat thinking yeah that's okay but it's been overdone which i think it has use your opacity on the layer remember the reason that we do it on layers is that i can go into those layers one by one and we can control how much of an effect the layer has so in this case i'm going to actually knock it back to I don't know, 55 percent, something like that but we get to a place where you can control how much of that boosting is done because it's on a separate layer same with the sky you know we can reduce that blue increase the blue um up to you but that i think is probably a nicer way of getting to a you know, nice and rich red um definite red rock scene that doesn't have quite so much of the light fall off issue up the top um it's got you know some of that fixed not all you saw um, but it's certainly improved and it's got that boost that it needs um to stop it looking you know, a little bit this feels like daylight which is odd because it was taken at i think sunset or sunrise um you can see from the angles here of the the light um so yeah you know that's how i'd do it but most importantly if you don't like the amount that it's been done to so we've got on there three layers you've got the golden hour layer which is just enriching it um giving it some golden hour light you've got the sky layer which is giving us more blue sky and more definite um cloud look or formations and then you've got the not sky layer which is taking the oranges and the reds boosting them and also adding a little bit of dehaze in um vascular docs back uh so given i'm looking at printing the photo how much would you overall lighten it for printing um at the moment you've got a bit of room in here um in your histogram for printing given that in here you have got bright light um probably around sunrise i think it was sunrise anyway um i'd be tempted to shift those levels up do not push beyond the point of data on the levels because if it's clipped in your picture it's going to be clipped when it prints so you're going to see white paper through it um, so be careful with it but what i will do actually just to make it a bit easier we're going to just put in a, a fill layer um, and i'll put in a global adjustments thing in there so levels let's pull that and we'll make things in general a bit brighter but this is remapping the histogram so it's taking anything that's 240 now becomes 255 and everything from that point down also gets shifted so if you look at this top histogram up here well we're just shifting it's not just the right hand side of it the left hand side is all moving along as well but it's sort of ramped it's accelerated towards this end on top of that you've then got the brightness slider now the brightness slider will shift this middle content left and right without pushing the edges off the end so in this case here for print I would be pushing it maybe to uh, too much probably about there that's where I'd leave it um, what I'm looking for is have I got this is a quite a contrast the image have I got a decent amount of contrast between here and here the overall feel of the histogram isn't too weighted towards the left which tends to result in a dark image um, but I haven't got anything that's clipped and there's a double check we can do for clipping which is turn on our exposure warning We've got a little bit up here but my exposure warning i think that is actually clipped because my exposure warning tends to be yeah 255 so with that done i'm not worried about brightness because brightness wouldn't have done that it's this levels that's done it and i'm just going to back that away to there remember that the exposure warning doesn't necessarily mean that it is white and overexposed it means that one of the channels is clipped in this case it's that red channel in fact it's not even at 255 but there are some areas where it's getting up there so the red so remember yellow in the sky isn't coming from um, yellow there's no yellow um, sensor array it's it's red and green combined if any of those channels red green or blue goes to above 255 it's going to tell you that it's overexposed in capture one i'd be okay with this um I, you know, I clipped red on there i'm not too worried about but overall that's the sort of level i'd be at to get it printed i think okay um jd i don't want this session to go off the rails but um the lcc issue raised yes so it is likely i'm just thinking about the practicalities of how we do it 
Um, it's likely that we'll probably do either a masterclass session or a pro tip session on it. My worry with the pro tip stuff is we design them to be really, really quick bite-sized things. LCCs are a bit more complex than that. It's probably likely that we'll do something in one of the masterclasses on it because um, we need to go quite in depth in terms of different cameras. We'll do you know, one on a Canon, one on a Fuji, one on a Phase 1 or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so that one done. We've, we've got five minutes left. Ooh, let's go to Dominique's quickly. Um the reason I say quickly is because actually there's not much to do in these shots other than one query that, that Dominique had. Um, so there are lots of variants in here. It's good, actually. So when we get an EIP through, um, the fact that I've got many different variants to have a little look at and compare is really good. In this one, Dominique's used different styles. So there's some elevation styles in there. There's also some of the style brushes, so deep sky, saturation, all that sort of stuff. It's a really cool image, and we've got this lovely little rainbow pop in here. Um, but the question was, can we make the rainbow pop more, um, and whether or not these styles are right? If I had to choose one out of these, and I don't know what order you, you'd done them in, um, but I would sort of be in this first place here, this one up here. I'm just going to mark that, because the other ones here, I mean, this is, I think that's probably the same cut. This one feels a bit too greeny for my liking, but again, this is all personal taste. It's 100% personal taste. These, I think, I, I actually really like um, this. This one's, I'm guessing, got morning... No, it hasn't. Oh, yeah, it has morning coffee. Oh, you double down on styles. Okay. So the morning coffee style is designed to soften stuff. So everything that we do in terms of you know, building in detail, structure, clarity, all that sort of stuff. Morning coffee undoes that, and it gives you that sort of, the idea is that sort of blurry eye sort of a, approach when you first see soft light in the morning. And this sort of shot really lends itself to that feel. Um, this one has got, I think, seagrass on it, but I'm not sure where. It's a bit of golden hour. Um, so I'm going to have a little look at maybe this one. And maybe this one. But in both cases, the answer for the rainbow is, is going to be the same. Everything around here, in general, has no color in it. So this is a gray sky. If I go to before, it's pretty flat and gray. But as everything's been lifted up, we lose the impact of the rainbow. Because before, it was all flat and gray, except for a nice little bit of, um, I guess, illumination and color. This here, because we've lifted everything else up, and there's a lot of layers on here... Um, we've ended up losing a bit of the rainbow. So a couple things we can do. First is, I'm just going to very, very roughly, um, very, 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 very roughly, put in a little mask over our rainbow. So with that mask, we can pull up a touch of saturation. Now, don't do this too much, because if you do, you're going to see the rest of the sky go with it but we can pull a tiny bit of it up without affecting the rest of the sky. We could, of course, be more selective with the mask. So once we know that that's sort of working for us, I can go in and say, well, actually, I'm going to remove some of these bits with my eraser. So we're only getting the rainbow itself. That's not a bad call. Okay, that sort of works. So there's a tiny little bit of color boost that's going to help. Now, next up, what happens if I put a graduated layer, and this is important because we want it to fall off, and with that graduated layer, I use a bit of dehaze. Again, not too much. We can fix the color in a minute. But with a little bit of, of dehaze, we can actually use it to get rid of some of the other color um, or the, the grayness that's affecting this color here. So I go from there to there. And we start just making the, the rainbow more obvious. This, this is not about painting in a rainbow. It's about making it more obvious. I'm going to use that same trick we did earlier about async or asym asymmetrical, sorry, um, <laughs> gradient filters, um, just to make sure that all of the sky is in here. Because we do want to make sure that anything I do drops off by the time the sea is there, so it drops off quickly. Um, but does affect the sky. And then finally, finite images, be really careful with this. Don't overdo clarity. But if you uh, if you do use clarity, we can go way, way up. You're going to get a little bit of a pop. Uh, because there's literally no, 
know, there's no structure, no texture, no nothing in the sky. We can, on this particular case, get it pretty high up there. I'm going to go to sort of 60 to 70. Normally, I wouldn't say do that. I'd, I'd normally say be really careful that you're not pushing it too far. But on this shot where there's nothing else in the sky really for it to pick up, you're kind of safe doing it. So I'd get to that point if you want the rainbow to be the most important thing. If I just clone that and remove the two layers. So it went from here to here. Sorry, this one. So this is our edit just now. That's the original there. So the rainbow is more obvious. It's more pronounced. But also bear in mind, you've also um, brought up some of the sky detail in general. It's just got a bit more grumpier um, in the sky. So be careful that you haven't pushed it too far. But the whole point is that with layers, so if I have, I can always pull these back. You know, we can control how much this is doing. In this case here, bit of saturation, bit of dehaze, bit of clarity. Those three things will start to make it feature a bit more prominently. Um, but other than that, I wouldn't change much more about it. Um, so it's a nice shot, Dominic. Well done. Cool. Okay, so that's it for this week. Um, next time you see us live will either be on the night masterclass so that thingy um the cityscape masterclass that is on the 24th of may and if you don't see me on that day you will see me i'm just checking the calendar on the 2nd of june so between now and the 2nd of june for those of you that are joining the live editing sessions go there um you will see that we put in any announcements any changes any questions or whatever but also you can so if there's stuff today um, that we didn't cover then please you know interact use it um, as a resource um, the pro tip stuff that people were talking about is on our channel so you'll find stuff in there you will not find an lcc one in there but um, several other subjects are of course if you want to send in your pictures then upload them paulreeforlive.wetransfer.com please make sure that you include your name if there's no name we can't include the picture it's really simple but um, go to that site you can upload your files either as raws or eips or even finished ones if you want to but just bear in mind we can't see what you've done between now and either two and a bit weeks time or uh, beginning of june look after yourselves um, hopefully go out and take some pictures that could be good so you get a break from me for a few weeks um, but go take some pictures um, send them in and we can edit them together All right cheers everyone bye bye